So welcome back. Okay, welcome. My name is Jacqueline Rhodes. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at Pinelands Preservation Alliance. And I'm joined here this morning with a number of my colleagues who um, includes Ryan Greck, who will cover different elements of the state of the Pinelands shortly, but also want to acknowledge Becky Free, who's our Communication and Membership Director, that's helping with our uh, live streaming today, as well as any technical issues that you might have if you have any issues, please feel free to post in the chat and we'll try to address it. But everyone is muted until we ask you to unmute and we will take questions at the end of our report by the press and then if time allows by others that may have questions. But please feel free to use the, the chat box as well. So we're here this morning um, to cover our State of the Pinelands report. And Pinelands Preservation Alliance is the watchdog organization for the Pinelands. This wonderful national reserve is 1.1 million acres, containing 17 trillion gallons of fresh water in the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer. It is a unique and wonderful resource um, that is recognized internationally as well. I'm sure some of you have heard this plenty of times over, but it's definitely worth repeating time and time again. And I will say that for our organization, besides monitoring the agencies that are responsible for its protection, we also believe in educating the public, about engaging the public, about sharing with them this wonderful resource and being good stewards of that land. And we try to um, show this through a number of our activities that we offer through the organization. So for instance, we run a number of education programs um, through our Pinelands Adventures, as well as offer a community supported agriculture through our Rancocas Creek Farm. So we're trying to work with many different avenues in which we can engage the public to be those protectors that we need for this wonderful place. And before I turn it over to Ryan, I just wanted to cover what elements we evaluate in terms of putting together our State of the Pinelands report. So this report started and was first released back in 2007. And we wanted to share with the public a way for them to see what has occurred over the previous year and how we are trying to monitor and make sure that government entities are doing their work and making sure that they're enforcing what they are responsible for and following their laws and following their rules. So six criteria that we apply in assessing these actions looks at whether each action includes one, upholding the integrity of the Pinelands Comprehensive Management Plan, which is, are the rules that govern, or govern the lay of the land. Two, protect native habitats for both plant and wildlife. Three, safeguard the quality of Pinelands aquifers and surface water. Four, ensure the integrity of the water supply for people and the ecosystem. Five, enhance the cultural and historic resources of the area, because that is absolutely vital. Knowing and recognizing the people that once lived in this wonderful place that have a rich history that we need to continue to remember is absolutely as important as protecting the natural resources. And lastly, advancing education about the Pinelands. So in reviewing the various government entities from the state, if it's governor's office, Department of Environmental Protection, obviously the Pinelands Commission, as well as counties and municipalities, we look at this criteria and where agencies are following their rules and taking appropriate action, or even going a step above that, we have given them a thumbs up. Where they've drifted from their regulatory mandate and took an action that in our opinion, obviously didn't meet this criteria, we gave them a thumbs down. And so we've been doing this year after year, and hopefully all of you find value in reading this information and hearing from us. And we will continue to do so. And we hope that even the agencies and government officials find that is a way that they can see what the public sees. 
and can truly remain accountable for their actions. And although we highlight both good and bad things, and we recognize there are a whole variety of activities that take place, ultimately our goal is to see more thumbs up than thumbs down. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Ryan Greck, who will cover this year's State of the Pinelands. Thanks, Jacqueline. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I hope you've had a chance to review the report. I'm just going to briefly highlight a few of the issues that we um, included in the report and, um, and share a few images uh, to hopefully help um, really bring those stories to life. So speaking of the thumbs up that we wanna see more of, I'll start with a, a few high points from 2021. Uh, some of the towns within the Pinelands, and there are 56 municipalities uh, that have at least part of their town within the Pinelands National Reserve that we wanted to really bring attention to include Egg Harbor City, which is where this photo is from, and also Waterford Township. In both cases in 2021, the towns had projects before them, applications before them to develop um, various projects and they, the town's people organized and showed up and made their voices heard. And in both cases, the, uh, the decision makers, the folks on these boards and town councils listened to their constituents and ultimately voted in accordance with what the people of the residents of that town wanted. In Egg Harbor City, there was a proposal to designate a park, a 400 acre public park as an area in need of redevelopment, really in a um, frankly manipulation of the redevelopment law. And the residents showed up. And in that case, the town council members actually reversed their previous votes and voted to not re re uh, designate that area in need of redevelopment and preserve that public park. In Waterford Township, there was a proposal for an auto auction on the site of the Atco Dragway. And in that case, the planning board rejected that application. Uh, we also wanted to highlight Evesham Township, which won uh, grant funding from the Inclusive Healthy Community uh, Program to partner with people with disabilities, their families, disabilities advocates, in their planning in the township and really being a leader in incorporating that accessibility into their master plan and other planning. And that grant program, the Inclusive Healthy Communities Grant, is the same program that kicked off PPAs, the Pinelands is for Everyone program. And it ties in with our work on equity and inclusion, which uh, is our issue spotlight in the report that you'll see at the beginning of the report this year. And our work is really to break down the barriers that have excluded marginalized communities from enjoying and using and taking advantage of the wonderful resources that exist in the Pinelands. Uh, the next issue I'd like to highlight is payment in lieu of taxes funding. This is the pilot funding that last year, and you'll see in our report, we gave Governor Murphy a thumbs up for restoring that funding to uh, $10 million, which it had been many years ago. And so this is funding that the townships to receive to compensate for the their open space preserved lands, at, which is of course a, a loss in rateables for the township. So this is to help those towns continue to offer the services that towns provide. And it's very helpful and the towns had relied on this and it had been cut at a lower level, um, I believe it was 6.5 million for a number of years and it was restored in 2021. Uh, sadly, we have recently learned that the copy of the budget that was the draft budget that was just released, I believe it was last week, cut that funding back down again to the 6.5 million. And at a time when New Jersey is enjoying a budget surplus, we feel that 3.5 million to get that funding level back up for these towns is a relatively small ask and it makes a huge difference to some of these towns, not all of which are in the Pinelands. This is a program that impacts towns around the state. So um, my next uh, point I would like to cover and I'm gonna share another image here is the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. 
and you'll see that we highlighted a number of their actions from 2021. Uh, but this photo is associated with the Southern Reliability Link pipeline. And in a very disappointing end to this fight that we've been in with residents and other activists and partners from around the state for six years now, the pipeline was completed in 2021 and the DEP finally investigated and assessed financial penalties against New Jersey natural gas for at least 13 spills that occurred during construction. And many of you probably remember in 2020, there was a highly publicized spill that actually destroyed a woman's home. Her uh, basement and uh, basement floor and walls cracked and her home was condemned and she was not able to return to that, um, to her house that she had lived at for decades. And all of these devastating spills that occurred over the course of three years for this pipeline, the DEP assessed penalties and then last year agreed to a settlement with New Jersey Natural Gas for significantly less than the original penalties, which we felt were, to start with, were inadequate to address the damage to natural resources. Um, so that was, that was a very uh, disappointing uh, turn of events for 2021. We also, um, you know, felt that the DEP has not taken meaningful action to address a gap in managing our public lands. And in, you know, the, the result of that are destructive activities that have been perpetrated for years in the Pinelands, including illegal off-road vehicle damage, illegal dumping, and the DEP has spoken publicly about starting a, a public engagement process uh, to actually put a program in place to address some of these issues. And we have not seen action from the DEP yet on that. Um, the DEP also last year approved a, a couple of applications in along Route 37 in Manchester Township, which for the first time permitted a mitigation plan for a uh, threatened and endangered species, the Northern Pine Snake in the Pinelands that use that use those properties and their habitat would be destroyed. And this mitigation plan allows for preservation of offsite parcels that are not contiguous with the development area. So not accessible to that local population of a protected species whose habitat will be destroyed and this is an untested, this is an unproven scheme. And some of our leading scientists focused on the Northern Pine Snake in the state feel that this would be an inadequate system. And it's the first time we've seen DEP allow something like this to move forward. And then I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here. And then finally, uh, bringing the attention to the Pinelands Commission, which is the agency we work most closely with, there was a, a flurry of activity, which many of you may have remembered in December regarding nominations to the Pinelands Commission. There had been a number of vacant seats. There had been a number of nominations made about three years ago that had stalled in the state Senate and had not been confirmed. At the end of the day, there were three new gubernatorial commissioners that were confirmed. We also had a new commissioner join the commission from the Department of the Interior and also Camden County had appointed somebody. So we have five brand new com commissioners and the commission's first task is to hire a new executive director. They've also been without an executive director for a number of months now. And we are thrilled with, with all of that and with everything that happened. We are thrilled that um, Teresa Letman was uh, confirmed to the Pinelands Commission. She was one of the nominees who had been stalled for three years. And in her confirmation, the legacy of Candace McKee Ashman, who was the last original Pinelands Commissioner, who was still serving, um, is her legacy is being carried on with a person of equal love, for the Pinelands and dedication to its protection and its care in Teresa Letman, who was Candy's choice to succeed her on the Pinelands Commission. 
We lost Candy a couple of years ago. Sadly, she was a champion and a hero to the Pinelands and statewide in New Jersey. And we are thrilled that her torch is being carried on um, with Teresa's addition to the Pinelands Commission. So we are now looking to the Pinelands Commission to hire a strong executive director to move the agency in a bold direction to tackle climate change, environmental justice issues, and the increasing development activity that we've seen in the last few months. So with that, that concludes my remarks. So I think at this point, we would like to open it up to members of the press and take any questions that you might have. Um, hi, can you talk a little bit more about the, some of the towns affected by the pilot uh, legislation and um, you know who they are and, and how this might affect them? Sure. So this program was, um, the, was enacted when the Garden State Preservation Trust Act was signed into law back in 1999. And it uh, was in 2010, it was cut by Governor Christie by about a third. And all it had been administered by Green Acres. But it, as that funding was cut in 2010, I believe it was a year or two later, the, um, the mechanism and the process by which that the preserved land was tracked for each municipality was, was sort of disabled. So at, the, at this point, the program itself doesn't really even have that sort of infrastructure support. So what that what happened when that funding was cut is that since 2010, any town that permanently preserved and protected their you know public space in their land, and this is either um, state or local owned land or nonprofits as well, didn't receive that comp compensatory funding to help with their rateables. So. This impacts um, a number of the towns within the Pinelands. Um, you know, some of the harder hit ones include uh, Woodland Township, Bass River Township. Some of these towns where really most of their, you know, with most of the area of the town within their boundaries is preserved and protected land. And, you know, with the funding being cut, it really removes an incentive for towns to prioritize permanent protection of their land. Um, but like I said, it also impacts a number of towns outside of the Pinelands as well. This time, Michelle. But Tom, you had a question? Yeah. Overall, um, I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to read the report yet. Would you say, I mean, given what's happened with the nominations and other things, would you say uh, um, the Pinelands is in overall better shape today than it was a year ago, or is it still heading in the wrong direction? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I would say the beginning of this year really highlighted at least strengthening the commission and that seats were filled. You know, we had the federal appointment, um, taken place, we obviously had some counties put in some potentially good people. So I think in terms of just the, the commission itself, we're moving in the right direction, um, but we definitely need an executive director. You know, it's really a function of um, what applications, what kind of development is planned for an area to truly know whether or not those protections will remain in place or whether or not there's going to be exceptions made. So it's really hard to tell, I would say, you know, it seems like we're going in the right direction, fingers crossed that things continue on that path, that we get an executive director soon, that we still have a vacancy um, that is still there, that will continue to see movement. Maybe we'd get the pilot restored to the level it was last year, as well as, you know, see a number of initiatives that have started um, really take hold. And definitely, we still need amendments to the CMP regarding a number of issues that have been pending for years. So with the strengthening of the commission, if those things happen, then I think we're really in a good place. Can you talk about, it was a big issue in our region, the uh, off-road vehicle damage. Um, 
what what in particular happened this year? Anything good? Anything particularly bad? Has there been any movement in terms of stopping it or lessening it? Well, there were two things that I would say have been a bit more positive uh, than we have in previous years. So there was a clarification made by the attorney general's office in terms of fines and how much should be levied against individuals that are conducting illegal activity using the offered vehicles. So that was done this past year, um, something that we have been asking for because oftentimes fines were given at around $74 when they were caught, they were pulled over. Now it's supposed to be at um, like $249 or right around $250. Legislation had been in place for many years, and yet people, law enforcement was still issuing it at the lower rate. We have yet to see, because that just happened a few months ago, whether or not that's actually being enforced. So we will follow that. In addition, there has been a little bit more press um, and more communication from DEP regarding the matter, much better than it was in many years prior. Obviously, more needs to happen, um, but hopefully, if the trend continues and processes work out regarding adopting the Pinelands Commission map that was passed a while ago, as well as having stronger enforcement and the usage of other tools, that we could see a greater improvement. But in terms of the numbers, we can't really say for sure because we're having a hard time getting good information regarding enforcement activity. But that's something we continue to track. Frank, I see you had your, your hand up there. Sure, yes. uh, Mich Michelle kind of asked my question, but just to follow up on that, um, I've been out you know, on the Potomac Trail, I've been out to Franklin Parker Preserve and all hiking and et cetera. And I've seen you know, deep ruts in the, in the, in the Potomac Trail and elsewhere. Um, so my, my question would be to follow up on that. Are, where, are you seeing uh, use off-road vehicle use concentrated in a few areas, uh, or are you seeing it all over uh, the area? Fortunately, it's not just a few areas. I mean, there are places, a few areas that are heavily used that are key locations for people to convene. But I mean, we're finding this throughout. Um, the Pinelands Commission had a study, put together a study looking at ponds uh, throughout the Pinelands. And, you know, we can share that information with you, but, you know, they did find a good percentage of those ponds where you can find activity, you know, road traffic passing through them, places that really people shouldn't be going. And that's the part of the problem. If it was just a few isolated spots where you could just block off activity, and then for the most part, not see any activity elsewhere, but oftentimes what happens as well is you block off certain areas, they find new spots. And so really it's just a matter of overall concentrated enforcement, posting of signs, blockading areas, um, having good maps, making sure people are aware of the enforcement, actually communicating when people are doing damage and really enforcing how much they are paying as it relates to fines, repeat offenses, and even confiscating vehicles. And we're not really seeing every level of that implemented. Um, so it is everywhere. Thank you. Again, I believe you are muted unless Becky unmutes you. So if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand or post or asked to be unmuted, happy to take additional questions. Yeah, sorry. I For some reason, I just clapped instead of raising my hand. I apologize. <laughs> hey, I apologize. I'll take a clap too. <laughs> okay. I also awesome. apologize. I joined a little late. Um, so if this got asked, um, this is Rye from Politico. Uh, the, the Senate uh, Environment Committee, Senator Smith, Chairman Smith, just formed this task force. Are you worried about what they're looking at and and you know, what they looked at last time. And I wasn't here. So can you sort of go over what they did last time that concerned you and how you might be concerned about what they might be doing next? Oh, goodness. When you say last time, do you mean last time when they had a similar task force? This was a number of years ago. When I think it was under Christie, right? 
yes, um, where there was something similar looking at what are the steps or what is the criteria for evaluating where forest needs stewardship? And then what does stewardship include exactly? So Highlands Preservation Alliance has been um, very loud and strong advocate for prescribed burning in the Pinelands. Um, this region, it requires fire for its livelihood. Um, if not, it, it would not be called the Pinelands, it might be called the Oaklands. So we need fire to suppress the oak in order for the pines to release its seed and continue to propagate. In addition, um, suppressing a whole lot of wildfire also creates these conditions in which mega wildfires happen. And so you need low level or repeat fire in certain areas in order to burn up that brush as well. So it's both from a safety factor as well as ecological. We're pleased to see that the department, DP, is working on using prescribed burns for ecological reasons now and definitely burning more than they had been in the past. But for the forest stewardship task force, it is looking at things like, where do you do thinning? Um, where do you manipulate the forest for certain types of plants or animals like birds? And so I would say we applaud Senator Smith for taking the time and talking with the various parties and putting together a good plan moving forward. There is a great makeup of individuals on that task force from various experts and people that actually do on the ground work to scientists. So we're hopeful because of that makeup. And, you know, I don't have any um, particular set of beliefs that the process is flawed or that it will come up with a system that we can't agree with. Um, so really hopeful that this will work out and we could come up with a plan moving forward. And it's how it's different from last time is that it's a much more open process versus the first round under the Christie administration. I know people had complained. I know we were one organization that was not aware of it happening until it was several meetings into the process. So now people are very aware. It's being spread throughout all the different organizations. Individuals can sign up. So that obviously indicates to me that it's much more open and robust process. And Michelle, you had a question why the governor cut pilot. <laughs> Can you make that phone call? <laughs> I know. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we would hope that something that is such a minor or small percentage of the budget would not be such an issue. But yet at times, you know, it could have been an oversight you know, wasn't just raised up to the surface when there's so many things included in the budget. And so we're hoping that's why calling attention to it now and knowing that it is draft, that it will be restored to last year's level. So otherwise, no idea. I don't see any other questions. And if anybody has another one, you can post in chat or raise your hand. Otherwise, have we suggested anyone for the executive director position? Yes, we have suggested that it is a person that will protect the Pinelands, they will follow the rules, and will make sure that they have the best interest of the Pinelands, natural resources, and people at the heart of what they do. That's what we've recommended. <laughs> I mean, we, over the years, have recommended people for, obviously, Pinelands Commission seats, um, championed individuals that we know might have had an interest in the position. Um, 
So definitely we continue to weigh in regarding that. But really at the end of the day, if the individual really can show about that they care, that they have the expertise um, and can manage an agency like that, that's, that's really what matters. So there's a question from Doug um, asking from the Pine Barrens Tribune, have you seen any environmental impacts yet from recent development in Medford or Marlton? Doug, do you have specific developments in mind or are you just generally speaking? Generally, well, you know, Marlton in particular is in the portion of the Pinelands um, that is designated as regional growth area, um, part of Medford is as well. And when the Pinelands um, was designed, there are, you know, there's nine different management areas, but overall, uh, this sort of the center part of the Pinelands is that the preservation or forest uh, management area, which is the sort of most protected in terms of natural resources. And then around the periphery of the Pinelands, you see your regional growth areas or Pinelands towns and villages where the development is uh, was intended to be concentrated in those areas. So uh, sort of the idea of clustering development and then preserving large tracts of those valuable intact forests, wetlands. So the the development, I think, particularly in Marlton, that's one of those areas that is mostly regional growth area. Um, that being said, of course, they still, you know, any any project still has to adhere to the regulations and the standards of the comprehensive management plan. And there are still a number of those, even in the reg regional growth area. So we try to stay on top of development applications that come and make sure that they are, are um, adhering to those standards and, and push the Highlands Commission um, when we feel that, that they aren't and are making, in, in our opinion, a wrong decision. I will add too that we've been working with both places in installing green stormwater infrastructure. And most of this having to do with already developed lands, not necessarily new developed. And our hope is that more of those practices continue to get adopted. Even though we have the new stormwater rules, the towns have until later this year, I guess, to officially adopt the ordinances, which is you know the green infrastructure rule that was passed by DEP. And the commission rules take it even a step further, which is fantastic. So hopefully, at least as it relates to stormwater, any of those developments that take place beyond that will have less impact than what we would have seen prior to the rules being developed. And there are efforts definitely by both towns to help retrofit certain areas and install rain gardens and bioswales and cisterns and all those green infrastructure practices that really are beneficial. I think, Rye, you had your hand up. Yeah, again, I apologize if, if this was asked before, um, but um, in a couple of other places, uh, notably, I think like the Adirondacks, there has been some concern um, that, uh, you know, state officials just haven't put enough money into doing climate change monitoring. And so, you know, some of the advocacy for, um, you know, things that the park would need or protected areas need. There's no scientific baseline to sort of see what's changing. And I noticed the DEP's budget is essentially flat this year. And I, I wonder if you could talk about, you know, is there even monitoring to understand some of the effects of, of climate change and other degradation um, to build the case that you need, you know, continued or more protection? You want me to take that, Ryan? Yeah, do you want to tackle that one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You can always do more monitoring, that is true. Um, but there are a number of studies out there 
that have looked at things like sea level rise, um, inundation of some of the Pinelands communities that are closer to the shoreline. And we actually reference that in our climate change white paper that shows with sea level rise and certain major flooding events, what that impact will have further inland along the eastern side of the Pinelands. That is just one example. Um, there are a number of other studies out there. Obviously, as it relates to climate change, we're a little bit, I guess, I wouldn't say fortunate in the sense that we will have more precipitation, whereas many areas have to worry about drought and becoming drier. But with that added precipitation comes a lot of flooding. And so we do know that trends are increasing for places like on the Rancocas watershed, um, where they continue to suffer flooding and places have been inundated multiple times that they are looking at to the Army Corps for ways that they can help elevate areas for different homes that fall within those um, highly flooded areas. So I would say the studies are there to justify changes that we need to take regarding managing stormwater, regarding looking at where we put development. I'm sure as you know, we don't have a lot of land left for development and now it's a race of protecting those areas to be set aside for open space, for farming and this and that, and really it's going to come down to, to redevelopment. But there are definitely many other practices and things that we are pushing the Pinelands Commission to do. And in light of all the budget and not having more money available to us, I think we have a lot of great resources as it relates to the universities, a lot of nonprofit organizations that are looking to this. So I think we would have no problem justifying changes that need to happen, changes that we have been advocating for the past 10 years, like protecting the water supply in the Vinelands. Um, because as development continues to increase for the last remaining lands, what does that mean in terms of water availability? So it would be great to have more money um, in terms of what we're dealing with now. I think there's enough research and reason to make changes. And then, you know, there is this great initiative called the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, in which we're a member of, that is looking to promote greater water quality protection, restoration. And there's a lot of funding coming through that from the, the federal government. And I think that presents some opportunity for restoration and projects and to combine monitoring with all that. And I'll just add the Pinelands Commission did add a uh, climate committee task, uh, it's called Climate Committee uh, a couple of years ago. And the full commission just at their last meeting um, a few weeks ago adopted a resolution to basically state that their goals in terms of considering land use and development in the Pinelands were going to be aligned with specific state initiatives such as the Global Warming Response Act. So we are pleased to see the Pinelands Commission aligning themselves more with some of these uh, statewide initiatives that are were de designed to address climate change impacts. However, we haven't seen yet from the Pinelands Commission concrete actions and we feel that there are a number that they could take right now and those are included in the links that Becky's put up in the chat there, the climate change white paper and um, our other piece that we have up on our website that would be relatively low cost, relatively easy to implement and could be done now. So that, that's what we're looking from the Pinelands Commission in 2022. I just wanna say there was a question in the chat about initiatives to, I guess, make access more equitable and inclusive, well, use and management of the Pinelands more equitable and inclusive. And so Ryan had mentioned our Pinelands is for everyone. And so, although I haven't been intimately involved in every aspect of it, but I know that uh, we had a series of town halls um, to gather input from people to figure out, yes, how can we do this? Uh, I know we've been working with a couple of towns in terms of creating trails that can be used by those that need to use wheelchairs or some other accessibility device to access those areas. So we are working on some of those initiatives internally 
and obviously looking for ways to work with the state in order to better advance equitable access. And I don't know if Ryan, you want to add anything. I'll just add that I, I think uh, another key um, way to address the equity and inclusivity issues in the Pinelands is partnerships. And so we are working very closely with uh, partners. We're doing, um, being intentional about uh, our work in some of the overburdened communities that were identified uh, by DEP through the environmental justice law that was passed. Um, so, so really expanding our partnership base, the folks that we closely work with and listening to those communities and hearing what the barriers are, hearing what the issues are, like Jacqueline said, and, and then doing what we can to support the work that those communities see as needed. And so, um, so that's a, a, something else that we have focused on um, in the last uh, year or so and moving forward is enriching those partnerships. Frank, did you have another question? Could have been left over from his hand before. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Okay, well, Becky will be sharing, if it hasn't already gone out, our press release and uh, our contact information is there. Please feel free to email or call us. And 